All right, we are back live. Can everyone see and hear me? All right, we are back live. Let me know if you can see and hear me. So that was that was quite a few questions we had there, and I thought now instead of just going through a litany of more questions, uh, I'd like to answer your questions, whatever questions you have here, and I got some good ones uh, here as well, and I'll start with these, and any other ones uh, you have, please let me know. But first of all, is, is can everyone see and hear me? Just give me a yes, if you can. Oh, really? Okay. I'm not seeing any of those. Yeah. Okay. I'm not. The last one I'm seeing is the Do You Have a Sample Food Journal? For some reason, I'm not seeing anything else here. I'm scared to refresh because if I refresh, I may lose it. All right. Well, let me go over the questions that I have here. Awesome. Um, really excellent questions. Let's go uh, through. Uh, here is one. Someone asks, Synthroid, what are your thoughts on Synthroid and what, in your professional opinion, is the best replacement for it? Well, I mean, I think as, you know, Synthroid is synthetic T4. It's, um, there are issues with it. Some people have uh, reactions to fillers that are in it, so that's a concern you got to be careful of. Some people don't convert particularly well. They have issues with conversion because... You know, Synthroid, being synthetic T4, has to be converted into T3. What your body does naturally is make mostly T4, about 97%. That makes 3% T3 also. T3 is about 10 times more biologically active. And then that T4 uh, has to be converted into T3 for it to be used. So the same thing with Synthroid. It has to be converted, and the places that it's converted are in the liver, about 60% is converted there. About 20% is converted in the digestive tract with good bacteria. Uh, and the final 20% is in the peripheral tissue. So if you have systemic inflammation, that can uh, affect conversion. Uh, gut problems can affect conversion. And liver issues, clogged liver, can affect conversion. So uh, some people have problems with conversion. Then some people have problems with absorption. So for me, you know, the important issue is let's focus on that process and maximizing that process in the body and um, I think that's in a, sometimes a more important issue than which uh, you know and this is kind of heresy I know people will disagree with this but I think that sometimes is a more important issue than which thyroid hormone to take now what you need really depends on your circumstances. And like I said, some people have problems with conversion and absorption. Um, some people do better with additional T3. So synthetic T3 is cytomel. Um, and then the natural desiccated hormones of uh, like a WP thyroid or an armor or nature thyroid uh, have uh, T4 and T3. It's four parts T4 to one part T3. So there's... Sometimes there's trial and error there. Sometimes, you know, really, I mean, you can assess how you're doing with conversion by uh, proper testing. Uh, we want to look at the free fractions of free T3 and free T4. You look at the ratio of free T3 and reverse T3, and that can give you a good sense of, um, you know, how well you're absorbing thyroid hormone. And how you feel is also tracks really well with how thyroid hormone is getting in the cells. If you're taking, you know, uh, a, a dose of, of Synthroid or T4 and, and you still have a ton of hypothyroid symptoms, then that's possibly an indication that you're just not uh, converting and absorbing well. So uh, I think improving conversion and absorption is, is a super important thing that sometimes is overlooked. Um, in my book also I put like, uh, kind of give a summary, and there's also a blog post I did on this on thyroid replacement hormone where I look at each different one and like what the results are when you take it. So you can kind of assess uh, where you are if you do the trial and error. So that's my take on that. Uh, Mark, what should I do if my hormone levels in the normal range but my antibodies are high? 
Uh, yes, I agree, normal HTSH, T3 and T4, but really high antibodies. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, there's some uh, studies that have shown that uh, thyroid replacement hormone lowers antibodies, but it doesn't for everybody. And, I mean, the studies, frankly, are not great. So that's not always an issue. Um, you know, it's important to understand what antibodies actually are. And, you know, a lot of people get fixated on that number, and there's a lot of emotion attached to it. Like, it goes up, they freak out, it comes down, they're really happy. But it doesn't always translate into success or failure. And it's really kind of a, a, a very separate issue to your TSH and your T3 and T4 numbers. Right? The, uh, the antibodies are, like, the important thing to understand about them is they, they don't really do the attacking on the thyroid. Antibodies, I like to use the military analogy when describing the immune system. So are these different parts of the immune system. There's the antibodies, which are kind of like military intelligence. They are basically like the CIA, and they gather information on the bad guys, and then they label them. They slap, you know, they put an antigen on them, and then that is kind of a flag which brings another part of the immune system. Uh, so antibodies are Th2, and that brings another part of the immune system, the Th1 part of the immune system, the T upper cell 1, which are the attackers. And those attackers are like your frontline soldiers, right? Those are like the Navy SEALs or the guys out there on the front line doing the shooting, doing the killing. Those are uh, the Th1 part of the immune system. So high antibody numbers are not always a, a hugely bad thing. It's really, if you have high antibody numbers and lots of killers, that's the bad thing, right? We want to bring this antibody number down because we want to reduce that activity, but we really, really want to bring down the number of killers because they are destroying tissue. They are the ones that are doing the real damage in autoimmunity. So that's why, you know, these Th1 stimulants we got to be careful with and we got to do things to come. Then there's a third part of the immune system that is like the command and control structure. That is the part that says calms everybody down. That's like the general, right? Who's like, okay, troops, stop attacking, come back, relax, you've done your job. And that part of the immune system we really want to strengthen. So vitamin D and glutathione strengthens that general, that regulatory part of the immune system. The, um, you know, things that are anti-inflammatory are the things we do to calm these other parts. So that's why we want to get off of these foods that are these trigger foods, because those are stimulating, sometimes they're stimulating Th1, sometimes they're Th2. Um, you know, that's why there's all this emphasis on calming all this stuff down. So we calm those guys down. Um, so, you know, things that are anti-inflammatory, like turmeric, like resveratrol, like, um, you know, different, again, in my book, I detail, like, all these different parts of the immune system and all the different things that you can take, potentially, for calming, but turmeric is a good one. Um, uh, you know, bromelain, papaya, uh, that comes from papaya, is, is a good anti-inflammatory. That's been shown to help reduce antibodies. Uh, in some people, there's a product called Wobazyme that's, that's pretty uh, effective. Selenium has actually been shown to lower antibodies as well. So it's all about this balancing act. We want to, you know, we want to strengthen uh, the regulatory part, which is calming everybody, and then we want to also additionally calm these other things as best we can. And again, remember, stress is very inflammatory. It can stimulate all of this. Uh, Lena Prescott from Apple Valley says, Hi, happy to be here. Happy you're here too, Lena. Came across an interesting article on the pineal, I think you mean, gland calcification being related to so many diseases, including autoimmune issues. Have you ever explored deep calcification of the pineal gland and what the benefits can be? 
Actually, I really have not. That's an interesting topic, and now you've piqued my curiosity. I'm going to explore that, but I have not really looked into calcification of the pineal gland. Very interesting concept. Mary Beth Asher says, another Hashi's guy seems to think that we should be paying more attention to how and whether available thyroid hormones can get to the cells. I think he might be referring to me, or maybe somebody else. I don't know. But yeah, I, that's kind of my thing, too. Uh, yes. Do you have to get the meds you need? Do the rest with Mark. Thank you, Mark. Small comfort. Yeah, the medical immunity is also failing many of these other issues. That's true. And it is all related to inflammation. Yes. Inflammation. Uh, okay, uh, here's someone says, I'm taking desiccated thyroid. I have been increasing my dosage trying to get my T4 and T3 to mid-levels. My TSH is now very close to zero, well under 1.0. But my free T4 and are still on the low end of the range. Do I keep increasing my dosage uh, or is something wrong to hinder the absorption of T4 and T3? Still have hypo symptoms, no problem with reverse T3. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, sometimes when you see that pattern with um, a low T TSH, but kind of the T4 and T3 still remain low, one thing to think about is the pituitary um, and that kind of uh, the pituitary axis. You know, so you got the thyroid, hypothalamus, pituitary axis. You have the adrenal, pituitary, hypothalamus axis, HPA axis. Um, sometimes working on that... Um, can be helpful with this issue and yeah I mean again you know, as I was saying earlier you know sometimes uh, we have enough available hormone but it's not being absorbed so what are things that are hampering absorption well blood blood sugar imbalances can systemic inflammation you know just in general can affect that you can get thyroid hormone resistance uh, the adrenals can interfere with that process so sometimes you have to look beyond the thyroid in other areas to see uh, it, are they hampering this whole process too. Uh, if I got an IgG food test and did not react to dairy, nuts, and seeds, is it okay to eat those? I mean, what I would say is um, maybe uh, what I would first do is eliminate them for a period of time regardless of what the test said and then reintroduce them and see what happens. Um, and uh, also, whenever you reintroduce things, reintroduce them one at a time as the only isolated variable, as you can see. Uh, how do you heal the brain after healing the gut, cleaning the liver? Great question and super important. Our brains are profoundly impacted by all of this. Um, you know, a, a lot of the things that are really beneficial for healing Hashimoto's are also really beneficial for healing the brain. But if you break down the brain, what does the brain need? What are some of the most important things for the brain? Well, we need to reduce inflammation in the brain. That's hugely, hugely important. So all the stuff we talked about with inflammation works for the brain. Then there are three major things the brain needs. The brain needs sugar. The brain needs um, oxygen and blood flow. And the brain needs stimulation. So uh, all three of those, um, you know, it's why blood sugar balance is so critically important. If you're hypoglycemic, it, your brain ends up getting starved of sugar. So that's not good. Don't let your sugar crash. Don't skip meals. Uh, make sure you start the day with a good fat and protein combination. Uh, eat frequently throughout the day to keep your blood sugar balanced. Um, also, insulin resistance is really detrimental to the brain. Because if you're insulin resistant, that means your brain can't absorb sugar. So uh, you got to be really, really careful about excess sugar. Because excess sugar is as bad as too little sugar, especially over time where it leads to insulin resistance. So sugar balance, hugely, hugely important for healing the brain. Um, blood flow. A uh, couple of things are critically important for getting blood flow to the brain. One is blood pressure. Make sure your blood pressure is not too low. Low blood pressure is one of the primary risk factors for Alzheimer's. That's one of the things that the, the neuroscientists uh, and, and, and neurologists are discovering. So you got to make sure your blood pressure is not too low. A lot of people with Hashimoto's uh, have low blood pressure, and doctors are like, oh, great, it's low, no problem. But you look, and it's like 100 over 60. Well, no, that is a problem. 
Like, yeah, it's good that it's not high, and then that way it's not a problem, but it's a problem for your brain because you're not getting enough blood flow to the brain, and which means you're not getting enough oxygen. So make sure you get your blood pressure uh, up if you can. If you have really low blood pressure, you know, a little more salt in your diet is going to help. Uh, nitric oxide supplementation can also help with that peripheral blood flow. The second thing that's important to think about with blood flow is anemia. If you're iron deficient uh, or, or if you have any of the other anemias, that can impact blood flow to the brain and the amount of oxygen delivered to the brain, especially uh, if you have low hemoglobin and low iron. So make sure you're not iron deficient. That's hugely important for the brain. Uh, and the third thing is stimulation. So the two types of stimulation for the brain, there's exercise, any kind of exercise where you're you know, doing both things, engaging physical activity is stimulating to the brain, and that's really helpful. The other thing is do some kind of brain exercises. Um, I like the program Lumosity because it's uh, very, uh, you know, it's designed by neuroscientists and uh, it's not super expensive. And you can uh, every day have brain exercises to practice. So balance your sugar, make sure you got good blood flow, you're not anemic, your blood pressure is not too low, and stimulate. You, know, you can also do things like reading and playing memory games, things like that. Uh, awesome. Do you have a sample food behavior reaction journal? I don't, but that's a great idea, and I'm going to put something together for that. I think I know there are some apps for that, um, but I don't have one to show you. But I'm I made a note, and I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do a blog post or something on, on how to do that properly. I really like that suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Ross, I, I'm not seeing any more after that. Are there more questions there that you could share with me? Oh, yeah, there's lots of questions. Okay. I mean, I could try refreshing, but I'm afraid it might screw things up. Should I try refreshing? No, don't refresh. Um, you right. can open up another uh, browser. With the page? The, uh, okay. The URL where we're broadcasting. Um, right. In the meantime, let's see. Is it possible to recover from Hashimoto but still work night shift? Okay, I don't know. Is gluten-free okay. bread okay? Well, wait, or let me, we need to mix? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let me answer. Okay. So is it possible to recover from Hashimoto's and work the night shift? Don't open the whole question. That was the whole question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's why I went back to the next okay. one. I was like, oh. Oh. Um, well, I mean, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I mean, you know, again, that kind of comes down to... All right, what's the consequence of that behavior, right? So working the night shift is definitely going to impact your natural rhythms. You know, you're supposed to sleep. Like yeah, you're supposed to sleep at night. You know, what happens in your body is cortisol should normally be highest in the morning and then should gradually decline throughout the day till you get to the evening. And then it should be low, and then melatonin spikes, and you should be sleeping and recovering. So working the night shift kind of takes that away. So over time, there's going to be consequences to that. Um, I mean, I, I think it's possible to recover, but you're certainly making it more difficult for yourself. Um, I would recommend working with your body's natural rhythms because, you know, there are chances that that behavior over time can compromise your adrenals. And if you compromise your adrenals, you're going to compromise your thyroid and you're going to compromise the immune function and you're going to compromise uh, a lot of the things that are critical for getting better. So uh, I, I think it's making things dip more difficult. Okay, what was the next question? Question is: Is gluten-free bread okay, or do we need to nix um, bread, all bread altogether? altogether? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those things. Um, you know, I generally advocate cutting all grains out altogether initially, and then you know, for a period of time, doing that, and then seeing. You know, you can try reintroducing 
grains, but it's a good idea, again, to kind of do them in a more systematic, isolated way. Um, and, and I think you have to factor in the other things, too. You know, the potential problem with grains is they can continue to cause problems with the gut. There are, there are what we call lectins in grains that, that continue the breakdown and the process of, uh, of destruction of, of the intestines and the intestinal lining. The reality is many of these grains that are, quote, gluten-free are close enough in structure to gluten that some people react to them. So while they are technically gluten-free, they may be causing a similar reaction to gluten in your body. So um, I generally recommend cutting them all together and then possibly reintroducing. Or, you know, there are tests available. Cyrex Labs makes a test where... Uh, called gluten uh, cross-reactivity test, where you can look at and test some of these grains to see if um, you have any sort of reaction to them uh, and your body has an issue with them. Now, all that being said, I think some people, one of the things we've found is that, you know, some of them don't do well on a very strict paleo diet with no grains because they're not getting sufficient carbohydrates for their needs. And... You know, so that's kind of the other side of that picture. Sometimes you may need something like some rice or uh, additional carbs. Um, uh, some people actually need it for T4 to T3 conversion, those carbs. So that's kind of a mixed bag. I'm not, there's nothing definitive on that. But I, I would recommend cutting it out for a period of time and then see. Okay, next question. Uh, do you have an opinion on cold laser therapy to regenerate the thyroid? Yeah, I mean, I think cold laser therapy really has some promise. I have a uh, colleague, a friend named uh, Kirk, who's a chiropractor here in California, who specializes in cold laser. I mean, he's very, very knowledgeable about it. He's looked at a ton of research. Um, and he's convinced that, uh, I've spoken to him in, in depth about it, actually, He's convinced that um, uh, cold laser can be helpful uh, to regenerate thyroid tissue. And I think something really interesting about the thyroid, too, is it definitely does regenerate. So if we can, you know, eliminate some of the things causing this destructive process, uh, there are things to do. Like, I, I've talked with at least half a dozen people who had thyroidectomies, like complete removal of their thyroid, and they grew back. <laughs> Doctors are like... Well, I mean, some of them grew back partially, some of them grew back entirely. So, I mean, it happens. It can regenerate. And if you look at the, you know, the research on cold laser and what it does, it, you know, brings more blood flow. It brings uh, more ATP activity. It does uh, help things that, uh, you know, and help the processes that help regeneration. So, I mean, I think it is possible. Um you know, one of the the downsides of that, and I've talked to Kirk about this too, is that, you know, when you have nodules, when you have inflammation in the thyroid, you know, using something like that to stimulate it could potentially um, make those worse as well. But again, I think if we're doing all these other things to reduce the inflammation and get that, that part down, um, I think it's good potential. So I, I think it's something uh, worth exploring uh, for sure. Okay, next question. Okay. Are antibiotics safe to take if you know you react to the fillers? Antibiotics or... An or yeah, are antibiotics safe to take if um, you know that you react to the fillers in the, in the antibiotics? Well, no, again, it's kind of... I think whenever you make a decision about what you're going to take... You should always do a risk-benefit analysis comparison. Exactly. So the question is, you know, if you have to take antibiotics for something that is potentially life-threatening or there's no, you know, then, okay, well, you got to do what you got to do. But so my question would be, well, why are you taking the antibiotics? What are you, what is the thing that you're treating? Is there another way to do that? And this is where I'm going with that. 
because, I mean, there are a number of uh, good botanicals and herbal supplements that are, are broad-spectrum antibiotic uh, in the way they behave in the body that you could potentially use. Um, anything with fillers that you can react to, there's a consequence to that. So uh, it, it could be a problem, you know, especially if it's a filler that, uh, that you don't do well with. So my follow-up question would be, what, what are you trying to accomplish with the antibiotics? Uh, are they absolutely necessary? And then do risk benefit? What's, you know, uh, if the benefit uh, out, outweighs the risk, then yes. But if it doesn't, then are there other options for you? Okay, next question. Uh, how important are probiotics to our systems? And do you recommend Probiotic America brand as they claim they have the most strands of candida fighting bacteria for the gut? Um, pro, I, I think probiotics are important. Um, I, I think it kind of goes back to the question of, uh, or, the, or the observation of, you know, variability and individuality. I think the reality is that, you know, some of these over-the-counter generic probiotics, like, not everybody needs those strains. So, I mean, if you can do it, I advocate getting do a stool test and find out what your internal environment looks like. You know, then you can like f make a decision on probiotics based on what's going on in that ecosystem. You know, just reading someone's sales copy and making a decision is not the best way to make a decision. Best way to make a decision is do a test and see what's going on in the ecosystem of the intestines. Then there's a lot of different choices. You know, I mean, there's some of these soil-based probiotics some people do very well with. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of different options, but I think you want to try them. Um, you know, there's these Megaspore ones that I've heard really good things about recently. Uh, I was talking to someone about that the other day. Um, I would say if you can test and do a stool test, see what's going on there first. That's a good question. But I, I think in general, probiotics are important. The good bacteria is critically important for um, converting thyroid hormone. That's one of the things it does. Uh, the good bacteria is good for keeping other species out, like candida and and uh, other bad bacterial species. So I mean. It definitely is important. Okay, next question. Uh, what do you think about taking vitamin C for therapy or taking a lot of vitamin C on a daily basis? Does it help to boost thyroid function? Vitamin C as in cowboy? Yes. So the question is, what do I think about vitamin C, high-dose vitamin C, taking vitamin C on a daily basis? Does it help with thyroid function? And does it help to boost the thyroid function? Boost thyroid function. Um, I mean, I, I think there's definitely advantages to vitamin C. I don't think it's the panacea of, like, the answer for everything. Um, I'm not a huge fan of really high-dose vitamin C. I mean, one of the things, again, it's sort of like, everything's about balance, you know. I think there's a... It's like a kind of a Goldilocks zone of vitamin C. If your iron is too high, you know, or things like that, like iron can be uh, a really destructive, toxic thing. And vitamin C, especially high dose vitamin C, can accelerate iron absorption. So you got to be careful. Again, it's kind of like there are consequences to everything. So. Um, I think in certain cases there are advantages to high dose vitamin C, but you got to really assess other factors, and iron being one of them. Um, does it help with thyroid function? I mean, it's it's, it's important with the thyroid. It can um, be found beneficial for thyroid function, but I, I don't think it's one of the top um, things for it. But it, it can be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Um, what is 
getting a miscarriage. We have an interview with a hypothyroid mom that we probably covered that. Yeah. So, the question is, what is the link between Hashimoto's and miscarriage? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a really good question. We did, I did an interview with Hypothyroid Mom that is available. If you email me, I'll, I'll share that with you. It's just some good information in there. I also did a blog post on it looking at um, optimal TSH levels through the three trimesters. Uh, I, I think there's a few issues. Um, you know, one, the, the, the elevation of TPO and, and antibodies uh, can be a factor. Um, and, you know, just hypothyroidism in general, uh, so, I mean, I think really there's, there's the autoimmune piece and there's the thyroid piece. So, if you're hypothyroid or if you're functionally hypothyroid, you know, that's something I talk about in my book, which is, you know, you have enough thyroid hormone, but it's not working in your body, it's not getting into the cells, even functional hypothyroidism can impact fertility. Um, because the, the thyroid is, is critically important in all phases of reproduction, too. It's critical for the developing fetus. It's critical for, um, you know, it affects other reproductive hormones. Uh, so um, I think it's really, really important to be as thyroid healthy as you can before you try to conceive. That's one of the things. You know that hypothyroid mom advocates, and and I think other people, myself included, in this area, are like, you know, a full thyroid workup should be part of prenatal care. Like that should be automatic. That shouldn't be something that's they look at later. So you know, you want to try and optimize your your levels. Um, and there's a blog post I did, uh, the, I think it's the American Endocrine Society has specific targets for TSH in the, the different trimesters. Um, and you want to try to get your antibodies down too because that can also impact things. So, I mean, the real link is that uh, thyroid dysfunction um, affects all aspects of the you know, female reproductive cycle. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, next question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I am losing weight without trying. Is this normal with this disease? Um, so this person asks, I'm losing weight without normal, or, sorry, losing weight without trying. Is that normal for this disease? What's interesting, okay. with Hashimoto's, I, I've observed two groups of people you know, we know the most common group is the people who uh, have trouble losing weight, who are overweight, um, because of the hypothyroidism and their metabolism slowing down. That's, uh, we see more of that, but there's a whole other group that have trouble gaining weight. Uh, I've seen this time and time again, and uh, it's kind of a subgroup of people with Hashimoto's. And one of the things I tried to figure out is like, what's the common denominator with these people? And the one thing that it seems to be is, I'm not saying this is true for you, but it's the thing that should be investigated is, you know, what's going on in the gut with uh, leaky gut, with uh, intestinal permeability, and then the consequences of that, which for some people are, is malabsorption. You know, so if you aren't absorbing your nutrients properly, you aren't absorbing vitamins and minerals, um, that can lead to weight loss. And uh, yeah, for some people, it's really a problem. So, um, I mean, I, I would, so that's one aspect that it could be. It could be just things have progressed further in the gut and you really need to focus on healing the gut and, and improving absorption. That means improving stomach acid levels, um, healing the barrier, healing the lining, uh, healing the gut itself. And the other possibility is you're, you know, running hyper for some reason or, you know, you may want to look at medication levels and things like that. But I would, first place I would look would be the gut and, and uh, healing the gut and, um, 
um, look for signs of malabsorption. You know, so um, on a blood, uh, on a simple metabolic panel, you can see, you know, what your calcium, magnesium, some of these, what your iron levels are, what your protein levels are, and look for clues to see if, uh, like, are a number of those low? Well, that could be a sign of malabsorption. Okay, next question. So the question is, the, what I think of the herb slippery elm to heal a leaky gut. Uh, slippery elm is uh, effective for um, it is effective for regenerating and healing uh, the lining. It's um, I think it's a good herb actually. I think it's one of those that. Uh, you know, if you have um, acid reflux or burning in the lower esophagus, it can really help with that. It can help with the lining of the stomach. Uh, it can also help with uh, uh, the lining of the intestines as well. So, yeah, I, I'm in favor of that. Okay, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on armor or nature droids? Uh, they are not synthetic, but they come from pigs. Couldn't that cause more disease down the road as well and are dangerous? What is your opinion? Okay, so the question is, what is my opinion on armor or nature throid? They come from a pig. Could they cause problems later down the road? Yeah. Um, yeah, they are derived from uh, a natural source. That's why they are called natural desiccated. Um things about them is like, I've heard it say like, well if the pig is hypothyroid you'll be hypothyroid well it's not made from one pig they're made from many many pigs it's all you know they make a, a batch put together um, the, the potential downside for some people some people react to the natural desiccated as though it's their own thyroid uh, and for some people it can cause an immune response potentially uh, for others it's not a problem at all um, the benefit of it is that it does contain T3, um, and for some people that additional T3 is really helpful. Um, the fact that it comes from a pig, I mean, I don't know that that is uh, any worse than, say, if it were a bovine source or, or some other animal source. I, I don't see that as a major uh, downside. I mean, I suppose potentially, but I, mean, I think the, the the risk is that you may have an immune reaction to it. Some people do. Um, but like I said, the, the the plus side is the um, the additional T3. Um, Armor does have some fillers in it that some people do react to. Sometimes I've noticed. Um, there's another one called WP thyroid that's uh, also natural desiccated that is hypoallergenic. Uh, that doesn't have those fillers, so that's an option. Um, but I mean, I, I don't see a huge risk down the road uh, other than the autoimmune potential. Okay, next one. What blood test do we test the soldier's TH1? Uh, there's a TH1 testing. It's called a cytokine panel, and they look at the interleukins for TH1. Uh, different labs offer them. The problem with it is it's kind of a moving target. Um, they're frequently changing. Sometimes you'll you know you get a sample, and then it's different by the time you get the results. So that's one issue. Some people have, like, they're really low, they're not detectable, and it doesn't always, you know, the immune system is constantly in flux and changing. So it, it really is a moving target. The other thing you could do, a simple kind of at-home test, is what's called a TH1 challenge. Uh, I talk about this in the book, uh, where you basically you get, uh, like, a mixture of herbs we know stimulate TH1, and you try stimulating it. And what this does, you know, you take it as your only variable for a few days, 
and see what sort of reaction you get. And uh, if you get a reaction, and you know, reaction could be digestive, it could be a flare-up of your, you know, where you're vulnerable, pain or or you know, mood or some sort of uh, and wherever you you have flare-ups. Uh, if it exacerbates your common, you know, problems, then uh, that's an indication. So that test is actually, I mean, it's not exact, but it kind of gives us a sense of, is this a problem for you? Uh, you know, the problem with that test is if you're really compromised and really weak, you, you don't want to do that. But, um, you know, if you're relatively strong and you can handle it, um, that's the way to do it. The other test, again, is called a cytokine panel. They usually test both Th1 and Th2 in that cytokine panel. Okay, next question. Yeah, someone asked me that question before. I didn't. I haven't had time to research that product. I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know if okay. Restore for Life is good or not. I'll, I'll look into that and and answer that question in a future broadcast. Okay. Uh, Mary Beth Asher wants to know. So, is it the RT3 number that tells us whether the thyroid hormone is getting to the cell? Yeah, the, what you want to do is look at the ratio of, well, the question is, is it the RT3 or reverse T3 number telling us whether or not thyroid hormone is getting to the cells? You want to look at the ratio of reverse T3 to uh, total T3 or free T3. Because what happens in the body is essentially T4 is converted to a usable form of T3 or reverse T3. Reverse T3 is the body's way of saying there's too much of this hormone around, we're going to encapsulate it here and make it inactive so we don't have too many problems because too much thyroid hormone is a problem. So, I mean, high levels of reverse T3 will tell you for some reason the body is saying there's too much of it around and we need to make it inactive. But often the things that cause that are like high stress, high, when you go through trauma, you know, something really stressful to your body, uh, or also uh, low iron can do that. Um, there are different circumstances that can lead to high reverse T3 that aren't necessarily reflective of whether or not thyroid hormone is getting into the cells. But the ratio of reverse T3 to free T3 or total T3 Helps gives us um, clues about that. That's a good question. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, is tingling of the hands and sometimes feet a reason to see a neurologist, or how can someone address this? That's so much money on specialists, and none of them look at the body as a whole. They just look at a lab test result, etc. None of my doctors communicate with each other. My estrogen is high. And when I told my endo, she said it is something you should bring up with your GYN. So frustrating. Um, yeah, it really is. For, I, I totally sympathize with your question. You know, the person is sharing how they, you know, the different specialists don't talk to each other. Nobody's looking at this problem systemically. Uh, no one's discussing these interactions and things. And the reality is it's all happening together. It is systemic. So I totally get your frustration. I am frustrated by this on a daily basis. Now, is it, this is the same person asking about tingling hands and feet? Yeah, that's, okay. that's a sort of, um, tingling so, hands and feet sometimes, uh, or, or is it a, uh, sometimes feet a reason to see a neurologist? So, yeah, the question is, are, are tingling hands and feet a reason to see a neurologist? Well, tingling hands and feet are a sign of some sort of neurological problem, potentially. So, um... You know, if they don't go away or, you know, if it's severe, I mean, I think it's something you want to investigate. The reality is sometimes with Hashimoto's, people develop neuropathy, and that's a common symptom of neuropathy. Um, um, tingling hands and feet or, or pain in the hands and feet. So, I mean, I, I think it's one of those symptoms that's a concern. You want to keep an eye on it. If it doesn't go away or if it gets worse, 
uh, then uh, it's worth uh, visiting a neurologist. I think so. Okay, next question. Uh, this person says there's no genetic history in my family of Hashimoto's. Can Hashimoto's diagnosis ever be confused with Epstein-Barr? Both show antibodies and the Epstein-Barr virus can escalate over time, also attacking organs with antibodies. Yeah, so this person says there's no genetic history of Hashimoto's. Could it be? Can, could the diagnosis be confused with Epstein-Barr? Correct. Um, yeah, I, I did a whole post on this. I don't know if you guys saw it. Uh, I, I really looked in depth into the relationship between Hashimoto's and the herpes virus. Uh, Epstein-Barr is one form of herpes virus. Highly recommend you read that post. I, there's a ton of research that I looked at. I really looked into depth. Um, uh, I can tell you that in my patient population, a lot of people have a history of Epstein-Barr. So um, it is potentially possible that it, I mean, those two things could be confused, but it's more likely that they are related and that the, you know, uh, Hashimoto, the Epstein-Barr was involved in the initiation and, and the, the progression of Hashimoto's. Uh, that's super common. Um, there's something about that virus and, and thyroid. Um, again, check out that post. Um, if you shoot me an email, I'll shoot you, send you a link to it. Um, but th it's a really interesting area. Okay, next yeah. question. Uh, from Crystal, how to regulate vitamin and melatonin so one is waking in the a.m. and sleeping at night? How to regulate cytomel and melatonin? Yeah, so when it's waking in the AM, sleeping at night. So I'm not clear. Are they taking melatonin as a supplement? Oh, wait, wait, wait. She, she wrote a correction. Oops, not cytomel, cortisol. Oh, cortisol. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah, because cytomel is, is T3, melatonin is, of course, Right. So. If you look at the circadian rhythm, it's really interesting. Cortisol and melatonin are kind of mirror images of each other. You know, so if you look at your, you know, if you ever did testing of cortisol, do a saliva test and track your cortisol rhythm, you can see, you can infer, you didn't really test melatonin levels, but you can infer what's going on with melatonin because it, it literally is the mirror image. So when cortisol goes up, melatonin goes down. When melatonin goes up, cortisol goes down. So that's why, you know, in the ideal cortisol rhythm, cortisol is elevated in the morning and declines throughout the day, and then melatonin is elevated in the evening and declines gradually through the evening. Um, so the best way to regulate that, I mean, first you kind of got to see, like, what's going on. Um, one thing that's interesting is, this is something I discovered in, in researching this sort of just by mistake, was that melatonin is actually a Th1 stimulant. It's interesting, cortisol is a Th2 stimulant. So they're very much connected to these different parts of the immune system. And the, I just stumbled on this research that was looking at uh, people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and it was flaring in the middle of the night and they were trying to figure out why. Well, they discovered it was because melatonin spiked and it caused the flare-up of their symptoms. Um, so the inverse of that is true too. You know, regulating immune function will help with cortisol and melatonin um, balance. Um, so what you want to ensure is that your cortisol is tracking correctly. And um, what I would highly recommend is just doing some testing if you can afford it and see, and it's not an expensive test, do a, a adrenal salivary index, measure cortisol throughout the day, and see where you are with it. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's helpful for kind of resetting cortisol is to do some type of vigorous exercise. It doesn't have to be long, maybe five minutes, like within uh, 30 minutes of waking. That's one thing that can help reset the cortisol clock so you get this spike in the morning when you're supposed to.
Um, but it's not always easy to do if it's compromised. But that's one thing that's possible for doing that. The other thing is just making sure you're, you're sleeping properly, um, you know, avoiding too many stimulants at night, balancing your sugar at night if you're hypoglycemic, having a little protein at bedtime uh, or a little bit before bed can be helpful in, in balancing that. If your sugar crashes, that can upset uh, that rhythm. Um, so a number of things, potentially. Very interesting question. Yes, next question. Okay, do you have a list of food items that mimic gluten? I do. They're asking for a list of food items that mimic gluten, have a similar structure. Uh, in my blog, there's, I did, there's a blog post called, um, I think it's like Foods That Act Like Gluten. If you search there, uh, you'll find it, or email me and I'll send you a link to it. Uh, there's a, a whole list of those foods there. It's about 30 of them. Yes, I do have that list. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. What are your thoughts of LDN? What are my thoughts of LDN? LDN is low-dose naltrexone. I just did a really involved blog post on this also. I looked at a, another metric ton of research. Um, I, I think LDN is a good option. Um, for people, there's not a, a big downside to it because it's really low dose. Um, I really, I looked at a lot, really looked at, you know, one of the things I discovered, I, I think, in the process is, you know, it's not, I, I don't think it's the first answer. I think we have to do all these other things that we've talked about. You got to look at these other systems of your body. You got to heal your gut. You got to deal with your adrenals. You still have to deal with all this other stuff. Like, the people that do that and then try LDN seem to be the ones that have the most success. Um, it, it's not a magic bullet. It's not something I think it's just going to take care of everything. You, you still got to do the work with the other in these other areas. Uh, but it, uh, some people swear by it. It's really hugely beneficial. But the, the people that seem to have the most success are the ones that do the work first and then incorporate it as part of their overall strategy. But yeah, I highly recommend you read that post. Um, I really looked into it in depth. As I am want to. Okay, next question. Okay, um, Mam Crazy 63 wants to know your thoughts on a ketogenic diet and Hashimoto's. Um, she says, I have a lot of weight to lose. Wondering about low carb and fatigue on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... You know, the, the paleo diet, the autoimmune paleo diet is, it's not quite as extreme as a ketogenic diet. So I, I'm a little more, uh, I like the autoimmune paleo. I think restricting carbs uh, can be really beneficial for a number of reasons. But I think the focus really is more on calming the immune system than, um, you know, putting your body in a state of ketosis. I, I don't think... And you know, like anything, there's consequences to being in, a, in a, a state of ketosis. Like, that's stressful, too. So I kind of advocate a little different approach. Like, I like autoimmune paleo because we're still doing some carbs in terms of getting vegetables and fruit and, and a few good carbs um, in your diet. But it's largely, you know, meat and vegetables. So um, I kind of advocate that approach. But I think restricting carbs... Uh, can can be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it possible or common to swing between hyper and hypo with Hashimoto's? If so, how do we correct it? Yeah. Is it possible or common to swing between hyper and hypo with Hashimoto's? If so, how do we correct it? Well, uh, it definitely is possible. Some people have this problem. I mean, often uh, this is, you know, one of the, the hallmarks of just poor management. So if you're swinging back and forth, you got to look at, okay, why? What is the cause of these swings? Something, you know, I mean, one factor that happens is, you know, you, you, you have something is triggering it. 
And when it's triggered, it causes this inflammation in your thyroid, and that inflammation in your thyroid causes production of more thyroid hormone. So that's one thing potentially. Are there triggers that you have not identified? Um, so you know that's kind of the uh, that's a rationale for doing the, the elimination diet, the autoimmune paleo approach to simplify and try and identify the triggers that may be causing that. So that's one potential problem. Um, I mean, something else people talk about, which I, I'm not convinced about, is like what's called pooling, is when you have like the thyroid hormone that kind of builds up in your bloodstream, doesn't get absorbed for whatever reason, and then um, gets released. Um, that's another thing potentially, although again, I'm not convinced that's a real thing. Um, you know, making sure that your liver is functioning properly, both phase one, phase two detoxification. So, because the liver is responsible for clearing out kind of these circulating hormones. Um, so, maximizing liver function, really supporting phase one, phase two, uh, is another way to help that. Um, but uh, I, I would the first place I would look would definitely be like, what, is there something triggering this, and have you eliminated uh, enough things to uh, to prevent that? Okay, next question. We got a couple more questions here, and we're gonna have to wrap things up in about five more minutes. Okay, well, I'll choose the best out of uh, these. Do you recommend intermittent fasting? I recommend intermittent fasting. Yeah, I know some. this is popular with some people. Some people really do recommend it. Intermittent fasting is when you you, know, you don't eat for periods of time. I mean, uh, I think it's you kind of have to look at, I know the Bulletproof guy, I forget his name, Dave Ash, Dave Ash, I think, is, you know, big advocate of that. Now, the problem with Hashimoto's intermittent fasting is, you know, if you're hypoglycemic, like, I'm not a big fan of intermittent fasting um, because you, you, you can't afford sugar crashes. Sugar crash is just too, has too many physiological consequences for the adrenals and the thyroid and, and the rest of this continuum that we're dealing with. So uh, it, if hypoglycemia is a problem for you, then I would say absolutely not. Do not intermittent fast. You need to do the opposite. You need to eat on a regular basis. Um, you know, if insulin resistance is an issue for you, um, then that's a different conversation, and that that it might be a, a good thing. But you got to assess what where you are in the sugar continuum. Uh, and if hypoglycemia is part of your problem, then I, I'm not a fan of it. Okay. okay. <laughs> person says, Mark, would you mind telling us what your own typical daily diet consists of? Mm. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. My my own diet, I mean, I basically live in the autoimmune paleo realm. I venture out. Um, I try to start the day with a good fat and uh um, protein combination, so I always have some protein for breakfast, and then I, <laughs> lately I have an avocado tree in my backyard, so uh, I've been having, I have a lot of avocados, <laughs> so I have avocado in the morning, I'll have some sort of protein with some avocado, um, sometimes I'll have bread, uh, I like to make bread, um, from you know things that are that I found. Uh, there's some grains that I found I can I'm okay with tolerating on a occasional basis. So I don't have that every day, but sometimes I have a, a piece of bread. But I always have a protein. Um, I seem to be okay with eggs on a moderate basis. So some mornings I'll have egg, and that I have uh, again some sort of protein. Some of the, some of those just have leftovers because I'm lazy. <laughs> for breakfast. So, uh, you know, meat and some vegetables for that. Uh, for lunch, generally, I mean, I'm a big fan of soups, too, so I like to have soup. 
uh, at least once a day if I can, because it's, it's just so easy to digest and good for you. Um, I'll do that. Usually for dinner, I'll have uh, a meat and vegetable combination. Um, I do have some limited carbs. Like I do have sweet potatoes sometimes. I do have uh, the winter squashes. I like those too for my carbs. Um, but my diet's pretty simple. And, uh, you know, I basically, autoimmune paleo is like my home base. And then I'll venture out uh, off of that periodically, but I always come back there. So uh, I, I just feel so much better in that kind of simplified realm. You know, like, and, and I've gone through the process, so I know the things that trigger me. So, like, I can't do tomatoes, really, or I end up in pain. I can't really do white potatoes, or I end up in pain. Like, I know the foods that I have to avoid, so I just avoid them. Um, sometimes when I eat out, like, I may, you know, come and encounter those and, and have to deal with it. But uh, by and large, it's in the ballpark of autoimmune paleo. I venture out a little bit sometimes. I might have an egg. Uh, I might have a, a, a piece of bread that we make um, with grains. I know I can, uh, but by and large, that's uh, I'm in there, in that zone. That's a good question. Okay, next. Let's do one more question, and then we got to wrap things up here. Okay, My one computer's more. Up. Um, how about? Um, how about the uh, Ideal RT3 free T3 ratio. Uh, the ideal RT3 free T3 ratio, I think it's free T3 uh, divided by RT3, is it should be 20 or greater. Um, so if it's below 20, that's not good for, that's for free T3. For total T3 and RT3, it should be 10 or greater. Although it's funny, I've seen some disagreement on those numbers too, actually, but that's, uh, I think that's a generally agreed upon good ratio. The thing is too, like again, you know, back to the individual variability, it, you know, it, it, same is true there. It's like, the same is true with TSH and these other numbers, like these numbers don't mean anything in isolation. Like what's important is where are you feeling best in relation to those numbers, you know, it's not the other way around. It's not where are the numbers best and you fit it. It's really where are you feeling best in relation to those numbers. Like that's the meaningful way to interpret uh, that data. Because that's what we need. We need to find like, okay, where's my ideal TSH zone, you know? The functional range of TSH is 1.8 to 3, but some people feel better below 1.8. They just feel really good at, you know, say, 1 or just below 1. And that's okay. It, what we need to know is, like, where do you feel really good? Because that's an important indicator. What you feel is, is diagnostically relevant and clinically important. It's the same thing with this. Like, where's the place with the, uh, of the free T3 reverse T3 ratio where you're feeling good? You know, so don't let the numbers dictate for you. You have to dictate the numbers. All right, people. I think that's it. That was absolutely awesome spending this time with you. I'm going to be doing these once a month. So uh, for the questions we didn't get answered this time, uh, I'm sure we'll have more next time. And and if there's a question that that you had or you think of later and you really want me to answer, you can ask me on Facebook or you can shoot me an email. I get a lot of emails, so it takes me a few days to answer them, but I try to answer every one. And my daughter's my assistant, and she'll yell at me if I miss some, so <laughs> I usually get to them. Uh, but uh, once again, I just want to express my gratitude to all of you for spending this time with me and for, and for uh, following me and, and you know supporting what I do throughout this year and and uh, you know it's been an honor and privilege uh, to work with you and I hope we continue uh, to work together in whatever capacity that is whether you want to work with me individually or just uh, follow my teaching and, and my blogging what have you uh, I just uh, you know uh, I love each one of every one of you guys I just want to say that and uh, I really have a great deal of gratitude 
for being part of this process because uh, you know this has saved my life, and uh, you know I, I'm I'm really passionate about it for that very reason because uh, I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't taken this path. So have a wonderful holiday, everyone, whichever holiday you choose to celebrate or choose not to celebrate, and uh, we will see you in the new year. I think that's it. I think my camera just stopped. <laughs>